don't bother me. And welcome to Let Them Talk. I'm Paul DiRienzo. I've got another great show in store for you. Uh, we have two filmmakers joining us, Taylor Dunn and Eric Stewart, and they have a film that they've been working on uh, called Off Country, and it has a longer name, Resisting Nuclear Armaments in the 21st Century. Only uh, they could not be directly here with us, so they've joined us by this new modern technology called Skype, and we can see you now. Welcome to New York City, and welcome, guys, for joining us on Let Them Talk. And you guys are, uh, are filmmakers. We're going to be talking about your film in a minute. You're, you're talking to us from a, a place in a corner of Colorado in southwestern Colorado, sort of near the area known as Four Corners, where a lot of this takes place. So we're going to be getting right into that in a minute. So uh, let me begin by asking you what, what this movie is about. I know I've seen the clips from it, but tell us what it's about. It's, it's really about the place where the first atom bomb exploded, right? Yeah, that's definitely part of the film. Um, the film is looking at landscapes of nuclear weapons testing, manufacturing, um, and the communities that live around them and the stories um, yes. that they have um, that are um, community, uh, sorry, oral histories of communities that have been affected by the nuclear industry. Mm -hmm. And by communities, what, so, a little did, did I know that there was a community that was in this desert area where the first atom bomb was exploded. Maybe you should give us some background because it amazes me the extent to which uh, folks, especially younger folks, are really out of, you know, detached from this history. There has not been a lot as far as movies. There's been some TV shows, a few books, but uh, this is something you don't know unless you really want to find out about it. So why don't we begin and go at the beginning and tell us why New Mexico is an important place and why you chose it for your film. Well, I love that you bring up that idea that it was this desert that was vacant of any people because that's really the, the mainstream narrative that, mm -hmm. the his, that history and the government is propelling. Yeah. You know, they said that nobody lived right in White Sands, which is the central part of New Mexico, even though right along that area was the Camino Real, which was the Spanish highway that went from Mexico City to Santa Fe for most of the 17th and 18th century. And within 150 miles of this place, there were 40,000 people living. And they set the bomb off in 19, I believe 46 or 48, I can't remember. 1945, it's right, right in between. Right. Um, but they set it off and they didn't give these people any warning. Mm -hmm before or afterwards, what they were going to be doing, or any of the health and environmental implications of that nuclear test. And we're really, we're trying to take a cohesive view to look at how everyone in America is a downwinder, especially the people who have lived amongst Los Alamos National Labs and around the Trinity test site and in Nevada. But it's an issue that affects everybody living in America. You know, in Rochester in 1945, when they set off the bomb, you know, their film was fogged by the bomb going off in Rochester, 2,000 miles away. And so it has very concretely impacted people there, but it's really a national issue. And we're trying to bring these stories to the broader discourse. Mm -hmm. So tell us what got you interested in this uh and not, not what, maybe how did you find out about it? I mean, did, how did you meet these people who you then videoed and, and I've seen in the clips from the film that you're working on? Um, well, we got interested in the project when we lived in Boulder, Colorado. We were both in graduate school. And Boulder is really close to the site of the former Rocky Flats plant where every plutonium trigger for every nuclear bomb manufactured in the, in the United States was made. And that was also a top secret site. Um, it's very polluted, contaminated. Um, a lot of people have been you know, sick that lived near there. And it was so close to Boulder. And it was sort of realizing the history of this, of this land, which they're now turning into a park um, instead of cleaning it up. Um, but kind of realizing the history of this land and looking at how uh, suburbia mm -hmm. is really sure. um, growing and nestling right up against it was just really, really bizarre. Uh -huh. And I think, especially for me, that was the first, right. um, my first interest in it. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we met these people who uh, in the 80s and early 90s and even earlier than that were really dedicated their lives to stopping the Rocky Flats power plant. It was, you know, 
They had concerts. You know, they would go trespass onto the land to try to stop things. They would have concerts, mm -hmm. poetry readings, and it was one of the largest environmental actions in the U.S. history. And when I found out about that, it just it totally inspired me. It inspired me to get involved. It inspired me to make these histories be more heard by people. You know, it shouldn't have been a surprise to me. You know, like this should be in the history books and it should be recognized. And it really, it opened the door. It opened the Pandora's box of kind of activism for, for us. And we started like mm -hmm. reaching out to people in New Mexico and elsewhere in the country to hear these really amazing stories of not just people protesting, but literally putting themselves on the line by becoming exposed to radiation, you know, by, by going on the site or, itself. They're, yeah, they're, yeah, exactly. They're trespassing on the site to bring attention to it, so they were themselves exposing themselves to radiation in order to make the point. Absolutely. Very interesting. Well, yeah, and they, I mean, we met these groups that were part of these backcountry actions that would hike out when they were stu still doing above ground nuclear, sure. and, oh, well, above, I get or underground nuclear, well, they were still doing nuclear testing in, at the Nevada test site. We met these people who would organize um, these backcountry actions. They would hike out in the desert for days and like, and literally walk out onto the site. Um, and they had this whole routine of, you know, letting people know that they were sure. out there so that they would prevent the bomb from going off. Sure. Um, and I don't know, it was just these stories that are so amazing and inspiring and a lot of these stories are, for me, I'm especially attracted to it because they're about really amazing women that are doing mm -hmm. this, too. So That's what I found all over the country. You really find places where nuclear waste has been discovered and buried, and the struggle to, to expose that and to get reparations and what have you is often almost entirely led by women everywhere you go, right? That's who directly feels, you feel are directly affected by it, the people directly affected. Um, so... You saw what happened at Rocky Flats where they made plutonium triggers. It became one of the most polluted sites. And, and there's a whole, I know something of the story, the FBI had to confront the military and it turned out they were purposely polluting and people were indicted and there were trials. Um, and, and now you're looking about for a, for a place to do a story or what draw, drew you to, to Alamogordo, New Mexico? Um, I think it just, I mean, it expanded. It's like you start to look, like I find that when I make a film or whenever I'm working on a research project, I just get obsessed. Um, and my research lead, like leads me into, a, I guess, a Jacob's Ladder. Um, and, you know, from Rocky Flats, it's, oh, okay, now let's look at the site where the first test went off and the landscape around it. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, like one thing leads to another. And, you know, you meet one activist and then they connect you to someone else and, you hear all of these stories, so. And it's really, it was in uh, the, the whole- Eric, let me bring you closer. Actually. You're so adorable when your heads are closer together. Oh, so okay. there Sorry. you are. Okay. Okay. No, it's all right. Well, it's really, it's a, it's a, it's a national program. Uh, the, you know, the Manhattan Project was spread all throughout the U.S. And really, the, the manufacturing happened in Boulder with the plants, but the refining of plutonium happened in Washington. The mining of uranium happened in New Mexico. The testing of the bomb happened in White Sands. Uh, the bombs were put together in Texas. And it's really this totally national nexus of different industries working together for this insane industry that only makes the world a worse place. And what's really dr bringing us, what's really focusing our attention on New Mexico now is that they're building a brand new plutonium pit production plant at Los Alamos National Labs as part of this massive trillion dollar uh, nuclear weapons renewal program that they're really, they're making Rocky Flats 2.0 at Los Alamos. And it's, it's just, you know, things are taking a bizarre turn in terms of national and international politics. Right. And this and, started under, under the Obama administration. It's being continued under yeah. uh, President Trump, but it's already was in, in place before this. And so a plutonium pit processing facility or whatever you called it, that mm -hmm. is to replace the one where they had so much trouble and ha they have not been making new bombs, new pits, which are the center trigger of the bomb since Rocky Flats was closed. And now they want to restart that. Is that mm -hmm. what, I, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, they want to modernize the nuclear weapons, um, you know, modernize them. Yeah. Yeah. They want to basically make them smartphones uh, and they can do all kinds of crazy things like the Russians just did a modernization program mm -hmm. and they they 
reconfigure their bombs so that they can actually navigate around um, around being shot down. They, they're connected to weather satellites so that they can calculate the maximum you know the maximum height to kill the most people and while they're dropping. They can actually take a weather report as they're dropping and then explode at the correct height. Yeah, they're hooked up to the cloud. Wow, you know? I've never heard about this. This is amazing. They're in the cloud, so nuclear bombs are in the internet yeah, cloud. Could be. Yeah. Well, that's what they want to do. You right. know? Um, but yeah. I think, I mean, we really want to look at these communities in New Mexico now because we feel like their history was never right. acknowledged. And we want to acknowledge that history, record those stories, um, you know, the people who were there when the first bomb fell, when it was tested, it was really, it wasn't the one that killed people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki directly. Those were the second and third bomb, but this is the first bomb, the test, the one that, the one that uh, Oppenheimer, what did he say? I am, I have become death destroyer of worlds, right? A famous quote from Dr. Oppenheimer, who was head of the project. So you went out there and you found the, the local people, are they entirely indigenous people? Are there set, you know, people who are of uh, you know, European background? Who was the people that you found? Well, the people who were living there um, in the 40s were Hispanic, a lot of, I mean, there were many communities. There were 40,000 people wow. living within- this is, know, In this abandoned miles. area in the desert, there were 40,000 people. Right, yeah, everyone thinks of it as being a place where there's no one living, but that's not true. There have been, fam there have been ranching, uh, Hispanic ranching families there for 400 years, for a really, wow. really long time, um, living yeah. off the land. Um, there were communities like Carrizozo, um, a whole bunch of small towns. Um, and I think we have really been connected with the people who live there when, um, because we interviewed this woman named Tina Cordova. She started the Tula Rosa Basin Down Winders Consortium. So she, and she's been doing this health study and collecting all this information about, um, you know, so many families that have been getting cancer, types of cancer. Um, and so she's really been helping us by connecting us with people who are affected by it. Cancer is connected to nuclear waste. When there's nuclear radiation and waste around a certain area, uh, cancers are expected to rise. Oh yeah, and all kinds of, like all kinds of cancers and autoimmune disorders, birth defects, um, sterility. Um, and it's really, I mean, there's not, I mean, there are, there's a significant amount of people living there, but if you look at the rate of cancer in the area compared to, you know, mm, rates of right. cancer per population in other parts right. of the country, it's extremely high. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the really heartbreaking things about the health effects is that there's a genetic component to being exposed to radiation that changes your DNA that doesn't just affect the generation that was present in the 40s, but that is carried on throughout generations mm -hmm. down so, the line. So let's say we're about halfway through. Let's take a moment to talk about uh, how people can learn more about your film and uh, where it's uh, where it's going to be. If it's, Is it done? How close is it to being done? And uh, and what happens when it's done? And how are you going to get it done? Sure. So our film... Let's talk movie have... stuff now. You... Sorry, what was that? I said let's talk movie stuff now. Okay, <laughs> sure. So the film, you can find out more information on our website. It's off-country.com. Um, and we're also, in addition to the film, we're making an oral history archive. So we're taking all of the interviews that we do, uh, whether they make it into the film or not, and we're putting them online um, as a digital resource so that these stories will be archived and preserved and so that people can listen to them. Um, and right now, we've been working on the film for almost three years. We're still in the production phase. Um, we're doing a fundraiser right now. We're trying to raise enough money. Um, our fundraiser ends November 6th. And where is that fundraiser that located? Oh, it's on Kickstarter. So if you go on Kickstarter, type in Off Country, you'll find it. There's mm -hmm. also a link um, directly to the Kickstarter on our website. Again, that's off-country.com. Um, do you want to talk yeah, a little bit more? Yeah, and we're just at like a really exciting moment, and we're doing this fundraiser to try, try to raise enough money to go do field work in Nevada because we've been look, looking so much at New Mexico and Colorado. We've had so many people through this fundraiser. We're not just asking for money. We're asking for all kinds of support, and we've had so many people from Boise, Idaho, to Kansas City, to 
um, you know, Las Vegas, California, Washington State. Yeah, well, all over the country have reached out and they're saying, come to our community, listen to our stories. We want to be a part of this. And we're trying to make more than a film with this oral history archive, right. is we're trying to make a movement to resist nuclear arms in the 21st century, to learn about lessons from the past, mm -hmm. to look at and learn sure. from the legacy of contamination, and to mm -hmm. think about how can we galvanize as a national and global community to resist this horrid industry. And so we're just asking anybody to visit our website and to support us in whatever way they can. And you Thank have you. clips there where people can see some of the work. I was watching some of it before I came, and there's some interesting clips and photographs and things like that. There's a lot of photography in here. You're not just filmmaking, but you're actually taking pictures, too. Yep, and we made, we just released today, we released a podcast. We're doing these little audio pieces. Um, our first one is about the Trinity site and the Tularosa Basin downwinders. That came out today. You can find it on SoundCloud and iTunes if you look up Off Country. Mm -hmm. um, we're also, another thing that's important is we are fiscally sponsored. So if you make a tax or if you make a donation, it is tax deductible. Oh, that helps. That's very good. So you have a sponsor, so you're not for profit. Yep, we're a non-for-profit. I mean, we've been making this film, you know, totally on our own dime. I mean, we got a, mm -hmm. we got a, a really Great. a small production grant from the Puffin Foundation. Right. But we've been, you know, working on it every second we get, mm -hmm. mostly traveling, shooting, and the right. fundraiser will help us. We'll be able to use the money to do more field work. Um, you know, we're going to Nevada in January, um, and then. You know, we're we're starting editing now, and we'll be able to transfer the rest of the film so that we can can continue to edit. And I I think we're both looking at being finished with this film in in the end of the spring. Yeah. No. Right. And so it's of, more. It seems like it's more than a film, really. It's a, it's a whole social movement you're creating here of people who are descendants and those who are still alive who lived through this horrific. Thing. Well, it was beautiful, right? Beautiful yeah. to see it, I'm sure. Did people, did you talk to people who actually saw the fireball or the light or anything like that? We, we're trying to find those people. A lot of them are dead, but we, you know, because it was almost 75 years ago now, over 70, mm -hmm. um, we have interviewed people who their parents told them about it, and it's yeah. really, a ba it's, kind, it's just mind-blowing. I mean, we, we had an interview session in Carrie Zozo mm -hmm. last year, and this yeah. guy, he like he didn't really want anything to do with us. He was like, no, he's like, I don't really have much to say. And then he finally told us, and he was like, yeah, my dad said he got up early in the morning to feed the cows, and it turned to daylight, you know, in an instant, and he thought the world was gonna <laughs> end. So, yeah. you know. Right. Wow, that's the kind of stories you hear. And uh, good. So, all right. So, and what is? Let's talk more. Let's get back into. Well, I'm actually interested in some of the technical aspects of how you're making this film. What kind of cameras are you using? What kind of equipment do you use? How are you doing this? Sure. So well, you want you can well, talk it's, about it's it. It's kind yeah, of unique us. because we both work in analog film, so we're shooting on 16 millimeter black and white, and we both have a profound love for analog film. Uh, you know, I teach black and white photography. Mm -hmm. We're in a number of collectives yeah. and groups that advocate for. Uh, a renewing interest in analog film. Mm -hmm. um, so we shoot on. I was the king of tri X in my day, so. Yeah, we're shooting tri X. <laughs> That's what we're doing. That yeah. was what everybody <laughs> used them when I was first. Uh -huh. But go ahead. That's technical detail for people out there. The type of really fast black and white film that a journalist used to use years ago. Uh -huh. But I'm glad you're still using it because it's great stuff. Yeah, and we love the way that it sort of references uh, early recordings of the atomic bomb, but it also references early landscape photography like Ansel Adams and sort of that crew because there's this real kind of what defines the West simultaneously is national parks and national sacrifice zones. And those are both two different poles of a land use policy. Right. Is and, it? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, and just sort of like thinking about the, the way that radiation has affected all of these drop dead, gorgeous, beautiful places, but they're poisonous in a way that you can't see. And so how do we render that invisible history mm -hmm. in, the, in the film? It's such a struggle for us. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's interesting. And you do it beautifully from what I've seen because you compare those incredible stark sights uh, and, and scenes in that area in the desert with uh, footage of 
a gigantic mushroom cloud rising from that same area. It's, it's quite amazing that you do that. Isn't it interesting that there is this move afoot to create national parks around sites in the Manhattan Project, which created the bomb? You have in Hanford, which I've talked about on the show before, is a, a, the B reactor is actually a national park. So you're going into the place where they made the plutonium that was dropped on Nagasaki, and it's and it's a, a site like where people pull in their kids and you know yeah. having everybody having a good old time. You know, well, sort of it's really bizarre, and it's really a strategy to not clean the land up. You know, at Rocky Flats, they made it a wildlife preserve because there's less of a standards to make it safe for animals than there is for people. And if people aren't living there, then it can have more contamination than it would if people oh. were living there. So it's this really bizarre rebranding that's happening to one, make it cheaper to clean up and two, to spin it to be more of kind of a nationalistic, patriotic Rah rah, you know, celebration of America's past, and this is not something to celebrate. This is our primary contention. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're basically celebrating the mass murder of hundreds of thousands of people. So uh, not exactly a high point in American history. Although the people involved, I can understand how they might not want to be seen as war criminals, and maybe they're no more or less than anyone right. else, uh, uh, not to be held personally accountable for what the government did. However, uh, that aside. For the rest of us, we begin to look at these things not as instruments of death, but, you know, beautiful clouds. Look at that. It's like the sun rising, right? There's a, a person I, I interviewed, a, uh, 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 a Miko Hakata, who is a Hiroshima survivor, and, and she says that every, she begins her speech, I used to love sunsets, now I can never look at a sunset. Sunsets to me now are frightening. And, wow. and, and the atom bomb made sunsets frightening. And, you know, that can tell you something about it right there. But you guys chose black and white. Is that to keep, you said Ansel Adams, you know, the great outdoor photographer. But you also said, uh, you know, when you see these old pictures, they're almost always in black and white. Anyway, so it sort of makes it more seamless with the stock footage of those, those days, actually. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're interested in drawing out those comparisons. And we also just have this kind of wonderful love for the medium and it's the medium that I work in as an artist yeah. and this film grew out of our work as artists but then it grew into something larger and really to just stay true to our sort of artistic uh, desires we're continuing to shoot in black and white mm -hmm. because that's how it started and it's Very what we loved and it also has these other connections okay, yeah, okay. We, Go ahead. we also have I mean we have the cameras we have the lenses I mean, I, I keep putting off buying a digital camera because you have to replace it every couple of years, and I'm using a camera that is from the late 70s and works like a charm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need batteries. It fits I wind with the it whole era, you know, you're, you're you know. photographing. Very interesting. And so, okay, let's get back now to all the depressing stuff. You know, I wanted to take a break from it for a minute, but we have to talk about the illnesses. How, what effect did this have on the people? What did they tell you about what happened after, 19, after July 1945 to their families? of these ranchers, people have been there for hundreds of years, their families have been there. What, what happened to them? Well, the most devastating thing that's happened is that you've seen entire family lines. So whole family names have been disappearing because people are dying, um, you know, young, or, you know, they're sterile, or, you know, they're passing on um, cancer to their, to their future generations. Did they and always know, go, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, there's this. We, we've been talking to this man, Richard Lopez, who's lived in the area mm -hmm. all of his life. And these words sort of ring in my ears. He said, how many thousands of years of life have they stolen from us? If they take 10 years from my life, 10 years from his life, 10 years from your life, how many thousands of years have been taken? And those words just really underline the slow violence that is playing out in the landscape. It's different than what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but it's still, it's this slow yeah. violence that's gonna play out for the next quarter of a million years or whatever. That's how long it stays radioactive. Is it some, still radioactive yeah. there? When you, you, you mentioned that, when you, you, you talked to some folks who had Geiger counters who were there at mm -hmm. the, tell us a little bit in the last, last couple of minutes about this annual event or twice annual event where people actually go to the site, they're allowed to go to the site. Did you go, you obviously did to film it. What was that like? Yeah, we, we've been to the site twice, um, mm -hmm. and we've been outside of it a couple more times. It's not than easy that. to get there, though. You have to do it on a certain day and things like yeah, that. Yeah, it's twice a year. It's the first Saturday in October and the first Saturday in April. Is that right? Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, it's really strange. I mean, thousands of people go out there, they visit it, and you get out to the site. I mean, you're you're mm -hmm. in a caravan, um, kind of, you're going across White yeah. Sands Missile Range. It's still an active missile range. Um, it's a big caravan, you know, with police and army personnel. And then when you get out there, you can buy like a breakfast burrito and there are people barbecuing. It's like so, it's so creepy. They're I like, I can't. Tailgating. I, yeah. Exactly. It's and really children were up. posing in front of the monument at the site of Ground Zero. Right. And, and it was, and yeah, go yeah. ahead. I mean, there's definitely a heaviness to it. I think people, a sadness, like a, a definitely like overwhelming feeling there that, you know, this happened and the world changed forever hmm. after it. Um, I don't think that people are making fun of it, but it is really, it's odd. You know, you can mm -hmm. buy souvenirs. Um, right. I saw someone dressed up as Oppenheimer the first time we went. What kind of souvenirs? Like patches, shirts, what stuff do they like say? that, books. I've never seen one. Yeah. What do the shirts say? Oh, well, they're just for like, you know, White Sands Missile Range or about right. that. Yeah, yeah they're like, like, I visited the Trinity test site, you know, just oh, really. Oh, I see. And all I got was this lousy radioactive t-shirt. How about the Trinitite? The, the, there was a lot of radiation on the ground you showed. It was actually still radioactive there on the ground. Yeah, and it's really contentious because there's different kinds of radiation and the, mm -hmm. and it's hard to know where the plutonium went. You know, yeah. only like 30% of the plutonium in the bomb actually fissioned, which means the remaining 70% is somewhere. Yep, it went up into is. the cloud. How, how much plutonium is that? Over, so. Yeah, and they just, they didn't keep track. They didn't look at it. They didn't keep any numbers. It's just kind of, it's unknown how much radiation is there. They say it's safe. You know, the reality mm -hmm. is no level of radiation is right. safe. Right. Any one, one bit of it could be, cause cancer. Uh, right. So it's still radioactive out there. Did you, were you a little bit, you know, did you feel a little nervous being out there walking around? And Yeah, yes. I mean, it's, it's a it makes me a little bit nervous, especially when it's windy and there's dust blowing around because it only takes one particle to settle in your body um, and th that can cause harm. I mean, we wore old clothes. I threw them out. I took a really good shower and, you know, scrubbed mm -hmm. myself as hard as I, I could afterwards. Yeah, um, it's that dangerous still after 70 plus years. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, Absolutely. I, I, I think so. I think you need to be really careful if you visit. Right. It's it's a risk. It's not the biggest risk in the world, but it is a risk. America's radioactive national park. All Absolutely. right, Eric Stewart and uh, and uh, Taylor Dunn. Thank you for joining us. We have a few a few more seconds. Tell us how people can get in touch with you again and find out more about your movie. Sure. So it's off-country.com. You can find our fundraiser on Kickstarter if you Google Off Country. Mm -hmm. Again, we're fiscally sponsored. Um, and sure. you could also email us offcountry at gmail.com. All right, and great. I just, I just wanted to real quick say that sure, we're crowdfunding this because we want this to be an independent movie bringing the, these issues into the broader discourse. Thank you very much for joining us on Let Them Talk. Take Thank care. you. All right, bye-bye.